and talk about how you got introduced into taxidermy. What, what got you started into this business? I actually, 40 plus years ago, I was real avid into drawing, drawing and painting wildlife. Real big into it, loved it. Uh, it carried over into some taxidermy work. And I tried my hand at, at a white squirrel, actually. The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. It's not wild cats, although we are in <laughs> Kentucky today. So, uh... Uh, we appreciate y'all tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. This is Tennessee Wildcast. We are in Kentucky with Mr. Butch Skillern, and uh, we're happy to be here with him. He is a taxidermist, and he also had the opportunity to uh, build a great relationship with Mr. D.L. Hayes, uh, the guy who caught the world record smallmouth on Dohalla. We're going to get into a lot of stuff today. Matt, and I appreciate you being here with me, helping me co-host. And I, I couldn't be happier. I, I met Butch uh, probably about a year ago. He mounted some uh, record fish that were caught in Tennessee for us. I got to come up here, and when I walked in this living room, I was just, I don't know, amazed at this. And I thought, we've got to get back up there and talk to Butch and let, yeah. him, let him tell us all about taxidermy and his relationship with, with Mr. Hayes. Yeah, I appreciate you organizing this because this is awesome I, this is an amazing trophy room right here well thank you and uh I, I guess we've talked a little bit before the show but did you harvest all of these animals or all these years? everything in here you can tell i've spent my whole life in the outdoors i mean you've got everything from musky to smallmouth to whitetails to bluegill stripe i mean it's amazing it's amazing i've spent my entire life traveling from california after some of the big fish here uh -huh. um Florida, South Carolina, Canada. Spent a week up in Canada fishing for them. So, wow. But my favorite place, believe it or not, is Tennessee. Now, not for basketball, but for fishing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said it right here, folks. He said Tennessee is his favorite. So that's, that's top fishing destination. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, we are, uh, you know, uh, an SEC rival. That's you right. Know. Well, let's just start off and talk about how you got introduced into taxidermy. What, what got you started into this business? I actually, 40 plus years ago, I was real avid into drawing, drawing and painting wildlife. Real big into it. Loved it. Uh, it carried over into some taxidermy work. And I tried my hand at, at a white squirrel, actually, the first item. And there was a gentleman by the name of Jerry Edwards opened a Bass Pro Shop up in Bowling Green. He was traveling to Florida, going to go fishing, and he said, Listen, Butch, I've heard that you've messed around, if you will, a little bit of taxidermy work. Tried your hand at it. He said, If I bring back two bass, will you mount one of them and put it in the Bass Pro Shop? I did. Mounted one for myself. I still have it to this day. It keeps me very modest. <laughs> very modest. But uh, from that point, it just grew. I had a guy approach me with a deer, white-tailed deer. He said, I'll buy the material. You mount it. I'll show it to people. If it looks good, I'll show it to people, and we'll see where it goes. From there, it went to this. Here we are 40 years Here later. Here we are 40 years so later. you're a self-taught taxidermist. Back in that day, there was so little knowledge, real crude forms, real crude material, very limited. Nowadays, the guy that wants to get in, it's, it's basically a college lesson. Now, you can go to specialists, you can go to experts, and they'll give seminars, right in their workshop, mm -hmm. or you can uh, buy DVDs and what have you. You learn from the best nowadays. Years ago, when we first started, you weren't allowed, and no one would allow you in their shop. They kept what few secrets they had. They kept it under wraps. Kind of like some hunters and anglers. Uh, I know. <laughs> they, they ain't going to uh -huh. tell you the, the whole they That's story. right. They're not going to tell you their honey hole. Uh-uh. So uh, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, it's not just, hey, I've killed a deer. Let me skin it out, and then I'm going to wrap it on this form. I mean, it's it's, right. a, it's a process. It's a process, and especially the fish. There's there's get, there's several people that mount deer nowadays. But it's getting fewer and fewer and fewer people that actually do the fish or are really, really good at the fish. And that we compete every year. We have people come from several states and have a competition, and it makes you step your game up. Well, you've got a few awards that you've won i have Can you mentioned a couple of those just to put it in perspective yeah i've won the last like the last four years and, and won several master division i've won it with a large mouth and a walleye and a small mouth and a brown trout uh the judge is out of michigan 
Uh, he's a world class, won several world championships himself, um, and it's uh, it's pretty challenging, but it's fun. That brown trout that you won with behind us back there, I don't know if the cameras can see it or not, is where did you catch that brown trout? That came out of Cumberland River, Cumberland River here in Kentucky. Um, yeah, th that was more of anything. That was a challenge from the judge. I'd won with every species but a trout, and he'd won the world with a trout. So he challenged me to bring one. There you go. So I set out to catch one and try it. And luckily won uh, basically every award I could win that year with it. So three, are three these that, that have won, are they the actual fish or are they a replica of that, that Some fish? of them are replicas. Okay. Yep, some of them are. Well, when I Googled you the other day to get your address again, this is no joke. And you'll, you'll be very humble about it, but it said Butch Skillern. Most people say this. Butch Skillern is the best fish taxidermist east of Mississippi River. Have you been told that before? I've been told it, but I've never went to the trouble to look that up. I've it's been told there. it's there. It's there, man. And, and after very good. having those replicas that you did in our office, mm -hmm. when you go around the backside of Butch's fish, the backside of it looks as good as the front side. And I just want to point that out because most of the time when you look at a fish, the backside's very like crude. You, you don't paint the inside of the closet, you know, at the house. Right. Butch paints the inside of the closet well, and he sorry, does it very well. Yeah, it's uh, years ago. Thank you, man. Years ago, it's sad, but they didn't. No one painted the backside of a fish and they actually wouldn't bother to put the eye, the glass eye on the backside. Mm. Why not? He had two. He had two eyes, <laughs> yeah. so why not? Well, with your mounts, I mean, it's not just on a flat board. Some of them are 3D. You're walking around them. You're seeing all sides right. of this stuff. I mm -hmm. mean, if you had a chance to see this, if you're watching, it's like, it's amazing. And then even the mounts that the mounts are on are even, there's more work that goes into those. It's there amazing. is. There's a great deal of work. That's, uh, I've won, like this award here, the mark, most artistic entry. Uh, that's a pretty big award to win. It's real difficult, actually. And that uh, brown trout's what won that uh, and last year. Explain the brown trout. It's got your actual f a form of your hand yeah. and a rod. And tell, just talk about how intricate that is. Well, I made a mold of my own hands, poured those and painted those right down to the nail, fingernail details and everything. Everything about it. I wanted it to portray that I was holding that fly rod and I was about to turn that brown trout back into the Cumberland River. Mm -hmm. Went to the trouble to, I set out looking for a, a shirt cut the sleeves off to put on the ends of that so that all the colors, the leaves, the shirt, and all that would match. Mm. And actually, the fly line and all, and actually the judge pointed all that out. He oh. said that's what elevated your score was the fact that you went to the trouble to match all that up. They look at the that detail. Stuff. They do. Yeah. In that master's division, they actually take a flashlight and look everything over on that fish inside its gills and all that. Can't be any dust. It can't, I mean, they look it over hard. Wow. And yes. how is it attached to your hand? It's got one little connect point on one of the fingers. That one hand is balanced on top of that fly rod, and it's touching like one of the fingers as if it's just being released. It would be probably challenging for somebody that didn't know to look at it and figure out how it's attached, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? It would. Yeah, because it's, it's you notice the head is close to the water, but it's not touching it. Okay. It's not touching it at all. It's impressive, Yeah, to Thank say you. the least. Really Thank is. you. So uh, we've been chatting before the show, but what's the most crazy thing you've mounted? And you may have a story to share about that. <laughs> and that could go from as much as um, a pet. I just mentioned this yesterday, I believe it was, that there was a gentleman had raised this real exotic bird. And he'd had it like 20 years. He gets up to go do something throughout the house and comes back. And he didn't realize his bird had gotten his chair and he sat on it and killed it. Oh, so he brings so he brings this bird to me to mount it for him. But I at this present time have two pets, two dogs that mm -hmm. the the folks want, the kids want, and they they're like, look, it doesn't matter what it costs, we want them. Wow, that's neat. You don't get asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that usually goes to the freeze dried companies, mm -hmm. the ones that specialize in freeze drying, which is something I turned down years ago. I thought it, I didn't think it'd go over, and that was a mistake. With freeze drying's big oh, really? now. Yeah, yeah, it's a big it's a big thing nowadays. Are you, you going to get into it or no? Probably not at this point. Well, no. so Jason's talking about unusual things. Well, in Tennessee, if you've been following the news, we've had a tiger sighting in Knoxville. <laughs> the tiger has its own Twitter account, you know, and it's it's been crazy <laughs> down there for me being in the news business. But 
un, unverified, unsubstantiated, and we believe that the deputy saw a bobcat at night, and which could be mistaken for a, a tiger. We understand that. But then mm -hmm. somebody saw one in um, Kingsport a day later, which turned out to be a bobcat. We have a picture of it. Um, but we understand that a large cat showed up here, and you had a little bit of fun with it. So tell us that story <laughs> if you don't care. All right. There was, there was a gentleman local here that had the Project Noah. And he had raised these lions and tigers and all. He had one cat left, and it was getting rather old. And he shipped this cat to Texas to a sanctuary. And they kept this cat, raised it, took care of it and all that, and it passed. When it passed away, they contacted him. His first thoughts were, bring it to Butch's taxidermy. They are wanting to have the cat mounted up, full body, donate it to the D.A.R.E. program, the drug program here locally. So they froze this cat up. Had it hanging up in a meat locker, froze it up, saran wrap, all that, packaged it up, built a big special box, if you will, covered it with ice, drove straight from Texas up here, backed up to the shop. So Bush decides he's going to have a little fun with it. <laughs> I hang it up on the front loader of my tractor, took a picture, and the caption was, 25 chickens later, look at here, guys. <laughs> well, it went crazy. <laughs> Literally, went crazy. Uh -oh. So, needless to say... We had to get the word out that look, it's just a prank, you know. <laughs> People it's, take take things seriously. They on take it media. serious. Yes, they so do. Your Facebook followers have increased, doubled, probably. Yeah, uh, at least. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the headaches has too. And uh, business has has gotten better. No. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, like we've mentioned, it it's not it's not an easy process. It it's 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 tough work. I mean, it's artistic and and you got to be focused and, and all that. But if somebody's want to bring you something or any taxidermist an animal what's what's some good ideas or t uh, tips for prepping their animal before they bring it to you that's big too do you freeze it do you not freeze it do you you know what all Wrapping do you need something yeah it's that's big on the white-tailed deer you naturally want to cut back behind the front legs in the rib cage area and follow the line of the brown and the white line and then cut down along the leg excuse me you never cut up the throat up through the brisket and up the, through the throat excuse me you will actually uh, you won't get back near as good amount, hmm. even from the best there is at it. They've gotten better at sewing and covering that up and all that, but allow plenty of cape. Okay. And then if you're not going to freeze that until you get it to them, get it to them immediately if you can. With the fish, it's a different story with the fish. Best process with it is take a wet towel, some type of wet cloth, wrap that fish in that wet towel. Put it in a trash bag, a couple trash bags, freeze that solid. The purpose behind that is when that wet towel freezes, it'll protect these fins. Keep them from breaking in the freezer if you move things around. It also keeps the fish's coloration. When I when you thaw a taxidermist thaws that out, it looks just like the day they pulled it out of the water. Wow. Just like it. That, that's great advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I wouldn't think I wouldn't know the most guys throw it in a plastic bag and chuck it in the freezer. It's, and it'll soon freezer burn. The fins okay. will freezer burn first thing. And by all means, the old old method years ago. Please, folks, stay away from it. Don't wrap it in newspaper. Okay. That's an absolute no no. <laughs> then newspaper draws the moisture. It draws the uh -huh. moisture out of the fish. And then it's stuck to the fish, and it's hard, difficult to get it off. I figured you'd have the latest news on the side. Mostly you know, <laughs> about the cat sighting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, now, you do a lot of replicas these days, too. Are you a big advocate of the replica, and is that going to save the angler money? It actually, money-wise, it's, it's more costly because it costs more to f build that reproduction. Okay. You've actually got more money in it. The taxidermist has more money in it even. Years ago, I would not, when I say years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have recommended a reproduction of no type. Hmm. One, the mouth interior didn't favor a fish at all. The fins were as, they were as opaque and non-transparent as the fish itself was. It looked real fake. The companies have gotten so much better. All the fins now are transparent. We've learned how to make those transparent. We've learned how to mold the heads they insert the inside of the mouth and all. You put them together. I set up in Tennessee at one of the big boat shows a few years ago. My table display had nothing but reproductions on it. There was like a thousand customers, potential customers, took cards. The majority of them asked, said, made the comments, said, Sir, you, you do unbelievable work. Do you do reproductions by chance? 
Yes. Matter of fact. Matter of fact, I do. I, you know, you're looking at them, but you can tell the difference. Tell the difference. Hey, that, yeah. that Gabe Keen largemouth that's in our office, I look at it and I'm like, that that is a fish. I mean, mm -hmm. I know it ain't because Gabe Keen's got his fish in that's his right. house. But in the gills, the in the yeah. throat, everything is just spot on. It's detailed out of this world right now. And I'm actually working on two. Mm. Two of uh, that very large mouth for Tennessee. Yeah. Well, I don't want to run out of time before we get to what we really came here before. 65 years ago, Mr. D.L. Hayes caught this bad boy out of Del Hollow. Mm -hmm. And uh, still stands today as yes. the world record That's smallmouth right. bass. Mm -hmm. 11 pounds, 15 ounces. And the, the craziest thing is, is that this man right here has the only exclusive rights to reproduce that fish. So how did you... Get the rights to that and tell us about your relationship with Mr. Hayes. It started out years and years ago. I was approached. Mr. Hayes called me. I get a phone call and he introduced himself and he says, listen, Butch, I've seen you work. I'd love for you to take my world record smallmouth, refurbish it, repaint it. He said, I'm going to be honest with you. I've spent since the 80s telling people that this fish came out of Del Hollow and the Chevy green paint came from Chicago. <laughs> that was his. That's D.L. Hayes' words. Okay. That's not Butch's. All right. But anyway, I went over, picked the fish up, met the gentleman, and we became friends, real good friends. Mm. I spent a lot of time with him. Got to know his family, got to know his wife. Uh, as you can tell, I was pretty interested in what he had accomplished. Did you know him before he called you? I actually did not. Hmm. I'd never had the opportunity to meet him. I'd never even, I had never had the opportunity to see that fish. Read and gathered memorabilia and articles and different magazines and all about him and all that. So you I was, knew who he was. I knew who he was. Okay. I was extremely interested in what he had accomplished. Yeah. And by good fortune, I was able to meet him. And he sat down, he shared some stuff with me. Of course, this is a reproduction of, that, of his actual fish, which I made him a reproduction of it as well. Um, there's an interesting story on his fish when he went to have it mounted the first time. In 1955, he froze this fish in a block of ice, shipped it by rail car to Minnesota. This fish is, of course, back in that day, that was their technique, and their mounting technique was crude, but it was a, it's how they approached it. And back in the days, 1955. 1955. It had a sheet of plywood, a cut-out sheet of plywood, with like plaster Paris or mache molded over that and that skin draped over that. Real crude. Wow. Inside of the mouth was actual wax. Some type of wax. They formed and shaped that in interior of that mouth. Okay. Because you even after all those years you could still you could take your fingernail and dig in that wax. Anyway, Mr. Hayes don't he said Butch in nineteen eighty I may misquote this, but I think it was in eighty six. But it was in the 80s. He was approached by someone to repaint that fish. He sends the fish up to Chicago, and they painted the fish up. He brought it back, hung it on the wall, been hanging there for many, many years. In 2014, I believe it was, I got the phone call from him. And while I had the fish, I asked him, I said, would you mind if I made a reproduction uh, and make a mold of this fish? And he said, Butch, you you have the rights. You do what you want to do with it. I don't you, I don't care. You earned his respect. That's right. You impressed him. Okay. Matter of fact, he wouldn't even allow me when I repainted his fish. He wouldn't hang it on his wall till I put a little plaque on it telling that I did. I didn't feel like I had the honor or the right to do it, mm. but he wouldn't allow it. He said, "Nope. Till you put it on there, I'm not putting it on the wall." Yeah, he had you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure did. And so over this time, you you know you've created this relationship and and. I mean, you got pictures here, and you could tell stories, I'm sure, of, of fishing trips. And, and just talk about that, that relationship y'all built. It was just unreal listening to this man. He was real witty. A lot of people don't know Mr. Hayes and his family had owned a grocery store, wholesale groceries, several of them. He was also a pilot, loved uh -huh. to build ultralight planes and fly these planes and travel. He just had a ball. This man was something else, and he was, as I mentioned to Matt earlier, he was just, he had a little sharp tongue, if you want to call it that. <laughs> but it was just enough to have fun with you. He'd yeah. pick and cut cut up with you and all. Yeah. We would back and forth to each other. and He'd call me up and we'd have good conversations. Or I'd go over and see him periodically and take him some fish, take him some walleye out of Dale Hollow. But, um, yeah, 
developed a good relationship, good well, friendship. I see, I contacted Butch, you know, a month ago and said, hey, could you hook us up with Mr. Hayes? I want to do the podcast with him. And he sent back, unfortunately, Matt DL passed away yeah. back in July. In July. At the age of 90. 95. 95 years old. And it was still yep. very witty. And oh, very witty. Mm. Had a, he could recall anything better than most of us. Wow. Right up to 95 years old. So that's that's what got us interested. So that's why the biggest reason we're here. Yeah. And yeah. so now here's the thing. Tennessee claims that as being caught in Tennessee. And Kentucky claims it as being caught in Kentucky because Dale Hollow Lake straddles. In reciprocal water. Mm -hmm. The line there. And so you know the truth. <laughs> is that correct? That is correct. Mr. And, Hayes divulged that, shared that with me, yes. And I imagine there's probably not many people that he would divulge that to. I'd say not, and I actually have it marked. He actually marked it on a map and autographed that, signed it as proof that, yes, right here. <laughs> and you fished that area, not I, even knowing. I didn't know it, unbeknown to me, and I'd fished it 20-plus years, mm. 20, 30 years. Same, same waters. Same waters. Didn't have any idea. What, no. Did you troll the same kind of bomber? I actually didn't. I didn't troll back, that. back then, but I do have a couple of the exact lures <laughs> Are you sure you want to hold that map? I don't know. I'm not taking it out of the box, I tell <laughs> well, you Well, this one, we have it where you can, but it's the exact size, same lure, same coloration, eyes, the whole works. And Mr. Hayes was great enough to sign these for me that I wouldn't take anything for. Wow. So there it Check is. Check that out. Yep. Um, this was the actual lure. He caught this trolling, you said. Well, it's a it's a copy. A, of, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. a repli yeah same, same, same lure, type of lure. Same type of lure. Same color and everything, mm -hmm. but he caught it trolling. Trolling. Early one morning. Tell that story. Uh, he had his wife and his son. They were asleep in the, in the boat, and he had trolled. He was going to troll back through. Now, you think about this, guys. This was July the 9th, I believe. If he'd have caught this fish in spring pre-spawn what would she await wow i mean this fish is 27 inches long 21 and two-thirds girth so we're talking about an absolute beast of a fish but he was trolling he had caught this fish like three times hung this fish like three times before and she'd always managed to get off she actually almost got off that day she pulled one hook completely off and the other ones pulled loose mm. on it uh, and what's interesting is even after all these years he still had the lure the same old metal rod, pin reel, the old Dacron line and all on it, right up to the day he passed. Yep. But it's, it's, it's just a pretty cool story behind it. So he, he if I remember right, I, I heard another interview that he had done that it, the fish was two or 300 yards or feet back and he was trolling and it was a pretty long fight, right? It was a long I'm fight. I'm sure you've heard the story multiple times. Yes, sir. But... Uh, it was a long fight, and he finally got that fish to the boat and had to net it, I think, to get it in. Mm -hmm. Is that right? It is. What's interesting about that, and if you listen to Mr. Hayes when he tell this story, he described in detail that he would have to hit this little lane between this grass, between these particular things underwater. And if you didn't hit it just right, you'd either lose your lure or you wouldn't come in contact with this fish mm. that she set up in that particular spot every time. Almost the exact every time, but if he hit it right, he'd hook up with her. It was it was he had it down pat. He had it figured out now. A fantastic story in Kentucky. Fish and Wildlife did an interview with him last summer, and he told the same story, and it was just neat to hear because I'd never heard it from from his mouth right. about how he caught it. And so he he didn't say in the interview that it was caught in Kentucky or Tennessee, but. He had a license plate there that said Kentucky and Tennessee. I think he's got one that says Tennessee on it. So. Yes, sir. <laughs> and you, you know the truth, and we've decided that it would be best for you to keep that to yourself. Keep that. I'm going to do like Mr. Hayes did. He told me, he said, Butch, that's the one thing I'm going to take to my grave with me. I think it's good. It's probably good you take it with you as well. I'll take it with me. <laughs> you might want to pass it on to one person, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Today? No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Oh, that's that's cool though, and that's a special relationship that you've built there, and be able to meet him and and be his friend, and I'm sure you could tell many more stories. And, yes, he's. And, uh, did you go fishing with him much at all? Did you ever get to do any fishing? You know with what? Him? It, when I met the gentleman, he'd had some issue health issues, gotcha. mm -hmm. and he had gotten to where he wasn't fishing. Yeah. Now, like I mentioned to you guys beforehand. Uh, tarpon fishing he mm -hmm. loved tarpon fishing he told me he said butch if you ever get the chance go do it it'll change your life actually so i'm gonna take him up on it 
But uh, Mr. Hayes would, I guess he had discussed this so much. I had taken, over the years, I'd taken other people to meet him and all. And he would talk about this fish and all, but I guess he had talked himself out okay. about it. He'd rather talk to you about some other type of fishing or flying a plane or what have you. Or yeah, just I, politics. He was real big into politics. He? Oh, yeah. he followed it, yeah, religiously. And yeah, We won't go into the details, but there was always a air of suspicion over that fish, and he said it cost him a lot of grief. He did. I thought that was sad in a lot of ways. It, it actually was, and I, I was saddened for him because he did. He said, look, Butch, I was just out fishing like any of you guys. Mm. Caught the fish, and it's caused me a lot of grief. Mm. Wow. And it weighed 11, 15 at both scales that day. And the, the measurements, I've heard, say that it probably could have weighed even more. Even more. When you take the actual calculation, the method that they use, this fish at 27 inches, 21 and two-thirds, the fish actually could have been in 13 plus, no matter how many times you calculate it. So, I mean, think about it. 27 inches. I've been in this business 40 plus years. The largemouths that come in here that are double digits aren't 27 inches. The majority of them. Whoa, wow. So there's no question in my mind. To After you've had your hands on this fish mm -hmm. and actually been near it. It's the real no, deal. It's the real deal. And yeah. to catch a smallmouth half that weight, you've caught a monster. A monster. You've caught a trophy of a lifetime. And then you've got several on the wall back here. What's your best smallmouth? I actually caught two seven-pounders back-to-back cast. There's a picture hanging up over here in December that year. And then I went back that following March and called a 7-6. Wow. Where'd you get those? They actually came out of Pickwick. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Came out of Pickwick. That's a Tennessee fish, huh? That's a, yep. How about that? <laughs> what about that? <laughs> yeah. So before we, before we get off here, you like to fish Tennessee. What are some of your favorite waters and types of fish to catch? I love Chickamauga. That goes without saying for the big largemouth because I've done multiple reproductions of that 11, uh, 15 plus yeah. largemouth there. Uh, I absolutely love Pickwick. Love it. It's my favorite place in the world to go for the smallmouth. And Old Hickory. Yeah. Old Hickory for the big stripers. I had fished our waters. I'd fished Lake Cumberland mm. for 10 years and couldn't even come close to it. Went to Old Hickory and hooked up with 40 to 50 pounders immediately. Gee whiz. On a special plug you were talking about earlier? Yes, I had a gentleman, older gentleman's passed away. He was up in Ohio that made these lures sent them to me and uh, I keep them close. <laughs> He's not going to share that with us either. Okay. He won't let us look All at right. him. Well, one last question. We're going to have to go. Do you think this smallmouth record will ever be broken? No, sir. I don't think it'll even come close to being broken. And I say that because of the fishing pressure. Our lakes aren't new like this lake was back in the day. I mean, fish were growing so rapidly it was unreal. Mm -hmm. My understanding, this fish was like 13 years old. Nowadays, a smallmouth's not going to live to be 13. There's too many anglers, and they're good. They can't hide from the technology and the right. graphs we've gotten on out. They can't hide. Well, I appreciate this time. We're going to run out of time. so I wish we had more. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for allowing you. us to be in Thank your home. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I so tell them real quick about Butch's taxidermy. If somebody wants you to mount something. Well, just you can contact me at 270-777-3258. Or email butchis, Butch Skillern at iCloud.com. You can contact me either way. Look forward to talking to you. Of, of course, I enjoy that. I think that's a big part of the uh, enjoying this, enjoying this business, is the outdoorsman. Thank you. I enjoy it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Butch, and uh, we'll see you next time on Tennessee Wildcast.